All right, we're live. Welcome to Gnostic Informant. You are about to attain true Gnosis. I am standing in for our good friend, Nil, uh, Gnostic Informant. Nil is dealing with a, a family crisis right now. His brother is in the ICU. Um, I'll probably repeat this periodically throughout the episode to remind people, uh, everybody, you know, keep them in your mind, keep them in your thoughts and uh, show him love if you know how to contact him because his brother right now is in the ICU on a ventilator and it doesn't look like he's going to make it. So today I have a special guest and I figure let's go out on a bang and, and have an enjoyable time for Neil praising his channel and his hard work and dedication. And he's a really close friend of mine. So I wanted to have none other than the legend himself, Dr. Robert and Price, join me to talk about dying and rising gods. You know, who wouldn't want to live and have immortality? I mean, sure, people can mock it and say no, but it's been a human condition since the start. And so I have none other than the master himself joining me today, Dr. Robert M. Price. How are you, my friend? Oh, doing great. Uh, still alive, though not resurrected. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, they say if you die before you die, you'll never die. And this is some of the ancient wisdom. So maybe we all need to do a do something. I don't know. Go and get into some mystery cult ourselves and experience true gnosis. You know, um, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Our friend Neil. Um, you know, he's he's happy that I have you joining us today. And I just hope, I don't know, I hope for a miracle, you know, uh, I would love for that to be possible. Who wouldn't? So for those of you tuning in, just remember Neil is going through a tough time. And if you have any questions, every super, every super chat you give to any YouTube channel goes to the person's channel that is hosting it. So every super chat you give is in support of Neil and helping him and his situation, his endeavors. So, once again, Natalia, I hope I'm saying that right. Your super chat went towards nil and uh, showing that love towards nil. So thank you so much for everybody's support. Feel free to super chat your questions. Um, they're really, really helpful for nil and what he's doing. But ask questions nonetheless. They all go to nil. And of course, we have the master here, Dr. Price. I've got to do a little plug for you as we get into this. You edited this version, this mm -hmm. book right here was The Christ Conspiracy by Dia Murdoch. And the recent review you did with my good friend, Neil, the host of this channel, um, he got a little flack back, if I could say, from um, the maker of the video. And, you know, I get the concern. Like, if you put a lot of hard work into the video of Zeitgeist, that could be a confusing thing and a problem if someone like you comes along and says, ah, no, I don't agree with that conclusion. I think that's overstretching the evidence or I've never seen anything that says that you're open to that evidence being there and convincing you. You just haven't found it. And I just say that to say, like, this is the latest and greatest of DM Murdoch's positions, all published and edited by you in this this copy. So we're going to get to that in just one second. I want to get this uh, super chat out of the way. Constellations Constant Constantinople. Thank you. True Gnosis. Thank you so much for the super chat. Everything, man. I'm going to just keep saying Neil's name along the way because his whole family is going through a seriously tough time. So thank you so much for that super chat and the love. Um, so Dr. Price, let me pop this up on the screen. You can't see this because you're a dinosaur. But that's okay, right? Dinosaurs can have things read out to them, and at least your ears still work, right? So that's what matters. Uh, <laughs> Peter Joseph was the documentaries, um, I guess you'd say, the, the guy who created the documentary, Zeitgeist, and what you guys reviewed. And he says, I guess any conversation is a good one. Here's the source companion guide. I hope they read it. Now, this source companion guide to the movie is something that uh, Acharya had published for her sources, like saying these are the sources that back up the claims for what you're going to say in this video because she already knew people were going to come out guns blazing. And so Neil says, thanks for the response. I think Dia Murdoch was on to something in her astrotheology work. The problem is that scholars don't agree. I thought by making this, I could show where you got things right and spark some new interest in the Christ myth theory, which I currently agree. Then there's this long response. I'm not, I can't even read that. So dinosaur or not, it's way too small fine print and I'm not even able to read this, but I think this is the notes in to the sources. I think the response continues. 
She was never the point of origin for any of it. All you have to do is look at her sources, which range across thousands of years of literature. Nil says, I'll, I'm still making my way through the rest of the sources you have here. I plan on going through the entire 220 pages. Then, um, then I don't doubt you. I'm going to look into it. Uh, okay, then I'm going to look into it and make a follow-up video. Regardless, your film is one of the most thought-provoking in the past few decades. The music and art made it awesome, and I was li I was a libertarian Christian when I watched it. It made me rethink a lot of stuff. I feel the same way, actually. Me and Neil both have that experience. Though Zeitgeist wasn't accurately to the T, it made me think Jesus step down a few notches and on the level playing field with other deities though he's painted as far more powerful than say Dionysus or other deities compared to, uh, that was something that happened to me. So Dr. Bob, I just wanted to say for the record, have you say on the record, what is this compared to the zeitgeist movie that is using her source material? Well, uh, I don't just pan the zeitgeist. I'd never seen it until the other day. Right. Um, it, uh, the the problem i saw with it was occasionally there are uh references to claims one often reads about other deities that were supposedly crucified or had 12 disciples and um much is made of uh the birth of these various solar gods on december 25th which was not originally part of the christian story anyhow uh, it's, uh, that's no, uh, you know, it's, it might have arisen by influence from the cults of Mithras and Horus, but uh, at what point? It's not a New Testament datum. And as for some of the other ones, the notion that Krishna was crucified, I, our Mithras, I don't uh, see where that comes from. Um, a check with uh, David Ulansi, who was like maybe the leading scholar on Mithraism. And I said, well, I don't know of it, but is there any um, myth or whatever that uh, says that Mithras was crucified? And he said, no, not at all. So I suppose he could be wrong, but I, I kind of doubt it because the, the uh, death and um, resurrection of uh, uh, of Mithras is really a different sort of a thing. It does fit into the pattern in that he, as a sun god, uh, dies, quote-unquote, uh, on the uh, shortest day of the year, and then uh, is born again on the next day because the days begin to get longer, and it's obviously a symbol for uh, for the, the sun and the equinox and all that stuff. And that is astro theology. And right. the, the Mithraic religion, as Ulansi shows, is, is certainly all astro theology clothed in, in the more ancient myth. Uh, but, uh, you know, th that's it's not quite right. Uh, some of the, if you really had a Mithras who had 12 disciples and was crucified and so on, uh, that's much more. Uh, damning to the idea of Christian uniqueness than what we actually have, though what we have does, in my opinion, show that Christianity is of those. Like there certainly was a sacred meal, for instance, and there was some kind of a baptismal ritual of uh, the tarabolium uh, about being um, covered in the blood of a sacrificed bull and so on. I mean, that nothing like that happens to Jesus, but you do have the the uh, imagery of being washed in the blood of, of the lamb way off in the book of Revelation. But so, I mean, that is enough, in my opinion, to say, yeah, well, we're dealing with common myth themes and motifs mm -hmm. and tropes and all of that. And it does erode the idea that, oh, yeah, this is just, you know, flesh and blood is not revealed it to you. It's, it's really discontinuous. Like Karl mm -hmm. Barth said about the incarnation, the word of God comes from without and owes nothing to to the world in which it appears that's uh you can't really make a historical hypothesis out of that and the idea that the uh the buddha was crucified though i don't believe he says that but but some do 
uh, that's uh, that's not really uh, kosher either, though there is an old play about a, a guy named Gotama, who was supposed to be an ancestor of Prince Siddhartha, who was wrongly crucified and so forth. So again, like there, there are these bits and pieces floating around, but it isn't quite the um, carbon copy sort of thing that zeitgeist seems to me. It's just overdoing it a bit. But yeah. the main point, I uh, I agree with him and said so in my uh, uh, and 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 so far as Acharya, it was the basis for her research was the basis for Zeitgeist in the original version of the Christ conspiracy. Uh, that's not um, I forget his name, the director, the filmmaker's fault. Right. But she got it a bit wrong, and the the reason we wanted to do a new version by we, I mean she and I. Uh, was to correct a bunch of that stuff. Uh, she uh, was appreciated the help, and uh, and so we made it an even better book. Uh, yes, so I, so, I think it's well worth the reading and studying. So she didn't throw away everything. I mean, that's no. obviously she just she just corrected and was more scholarly in her approach mm. than she was previously. And so for those who didn't know, I mean, I'm giving this heads up, and even for Peter, uh, who is the producer of the zeitgeist film this is the updated version of her ideas uh did did you put any of your own thoughts or are these her thoughts that you edited and put into a book uh it's i think the only thing i really added was maybe to take a couple of her observations a little bit farther uh to show how right she was more oh, wow. than she knew even uh, but I uh, I did cut out a bunch of stuff that seemed to me way beside the point okay. that uh, diluted the focus of the book. Um, but um, I, I guess I added some sum up material, but I believe it is. I mean, she bequeathed me this this task, which I was greatly privileged and happy yeah. to do. But I have tried to do what she would have done because she had changed views. The woman was an indefatigable researcher. Uh, she really knew a lot of stuff that I had never heard of. Uh, so yeah. and uh, it'd be interesting to see if there was a new version of Zeitgeist. Um, That'd be cool. I mean, she yeah. she was ready to take on an update. Uh, maybe maybe there's an updated uh, documentary there. That, I loved the original one. I didn't get into all the other different videos he had, but that specific one when it came to Jesus and the dying mm. and rising God motifs and astrotheology, et cetera, loved it. So uh, let's get into the true gnosis here. Uh, mm. Brett Baxter, thank you so much for the super chat. This Everybody who super chats, just keep in mind, it's helping Neil out. So him mm. and his family. Ask Dr. Bob if Osiris was resurrected or was Horus the resurrection itself? Both. Uh, the, it's, it's really remarkable. He is um, slain by, really suffocated by uh, his evil brother Set. It's sort of like a Thor Loki kind of thing. And uh, he was nailed shut into a sarcophagus, but, but it wasn't, you know, in his body. He was just trapped inside it. And uh, they uh, grabbed the thing once they were done and set it adrift on the Nile. And, of course, he suffocated uh, because he's pictured as a flesh and blood person. And the um, his his two wives, uh, Isis and Nephthys, go in search. That's always an element in these dying and rising gods things. The, the consort of, of the god uh, goes in search of the body. Well, they find it. And... Uh, it, it somehow become lodged in a tree trunk, which is an interesting Attis parallel, but nonetheless, uh, they they get it, but lose it again, and this time Set chops the body up like uh, Saul does with uh, the uh, the concubine in the book of uh, uh, First Samuel, and, um, and Isis has to get all the pieces and reassemble them, and she manages to get all of them except the penis, uh, but she magically creates a new one. And uh, 
Osiris comes back to life and impregnates her on the spot. Now, he has a double resurrection because he then goes down to Amente, the netherworld of the dead, where he sits on a throne as the judge of the living and the dead. Uh, and uh, everyone appears before him and so on, just like Jesus. Uh, it's just some people say, oh, well, he didn't go to heaven. Yeah, yeah, that was the Egyptian heaven. Uh, that was the world of the dead. So that's a, an absurd, uh, irrelevant difference. But also, Isis with Horus, who is his son and reincarnation. So he yeah. is like the earthly resurrection. I mean, Osiris is resurrected on earth, but then leaves for the netherworld. Um, Horus is resurrected on earth in order to take vengeance on Set, which he does. And he becomes the sun falcon. Uh, so he becomes a sort of second character, but he is the resurrection, one of the two resurrections. Wow. Um, I'm probably going to have to tell this story to my wife, and she might identify herself with Isis. Uh, she, she, she's just like, what would I do without you? And I'm going to have to, this, this is definitely not for anything under PG uh, 18 or whatever. <laughs> but my wife will relate to Isis because she always makes these threats to me. Do I need to cut it off? I'm like, what would you do without me if you did? I mean, you know, uh, anyway, <laughs> being just, just being funny. So thank you so much, Brett, for that super chat. I guess um, many people will like attack the idea that you would say, oh, wh why are you comparing Osiris to Jesus? Can you do that quick uh, comparison for us while we have you here on the Osiris topic? Well, uh, there's the, uh, the, well, it's hard to do that comparison without throwing Joseph into it, but let's not do that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, we did write something on that, yeah. just so people know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, for instance, uh, Osiris is betrayed by a brother, just as uh, uh, Jesus was betrayed by one of his disciples, and uh, he as I said, he, he did die and holy women pursued the body and found it. And I tend to think that what we have is some of the Osiris elements reshuffled a bit because uh, we have in the story of the anointing at Bethany, this interesting notion that when Jesus defends the, the unnamed woman who in the narrative has to be Mary Magdalene, but her name's been omitted, uh, he defends her saying, she saved it for my burial. Well, then they do bring spices and oint unguents and stuff uh, to the tomb. And in the canonical versions, they find it empty because he's raised from the dead already. I would just bet that originally uh, the anointing at Bethany happened at the empty, at the tomb, which was not empty that they found the slain Jesus as they expected to, anointed the body, and he rose from the dead there. Uh, and that that was the uh, that was the resurrection and why it why Jesus is even called the anointed one because like Osiris, it was the anointing with oil by the holy women that raised him from the dead. Uh, so there, there's that, and he becomes the judge of the living and the dead. He, he sits on a divine throne in the uh, the afterworld, and there are, are, are other uh, things as well. But these are some of the biggies. Uh, the uh, and it's it's just it's like Horus is sort of like the Paraclete, uh, another version of Jesus that substitutes for his presence on earth. And uh, so I. Um, think that uh, it, it does seem to be. There are other parallels with Dionysus, whom the ancients thought was just another name for Osiris anyway. And uh, so it, it seems to me, I'm, I know I'm forgetting some of it, but there there are a lot of Jesus and Osiris um, similarities. And it's no surprise since uh, ancient Israelites certainly knew about Osiris, even if it weren't so patently obvious that the Joseph uh, story is a uh, Judaized version of Osiris. Uh, you don't even need that. You can just compare the two and realize that 
uh, that uh, since Egypt ruled Palestine for a thousand years, they, they had to know about this. Yeah. Uh, and so on. No, no, no. That's that brings up an interesting point of the article that, well, n- not article. You It's a publication in the Journal of Higher Criticism for everybody who's interested. We did a mm-hmm. comparison between first Osiris, then we went to Joseph in the Hebrew Bible, mm-hmm. then we ended up going to Jesus. Then we went to Josephus. I mean, we actually went all the way from Osiris to Josephus. And um, people might go, parallelomania, but nah, I I, I think there's something. You can't deny some of the stuff that I was pointing out between Joseph and the passion narrative. The whole Mm -hmm. eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, or like do this in remembrance. Yeah, oh, that's another one. Yeah, the sacramental body and blood, yeah. Yeah, that was what blew me away is like Joseph tells the wine bearer as he's being taken out of the dungeon don't forget about me remember me and then jesus says to his disciples do this in remembrance of me you know remember me by doing this like remember me don't forget about me it's Mm. so interesting i i fall in love with the stories i'm a big Mm. fan of all of that stuff so Mm. you really get the mind working in a way i'm not used to hearing scholarship talk about that's what makes you unique so thank you again, Brett, for the uh, super chat and helping out. For those who are just tuning in, Neil's uh, twin brother, not just his brother, but his his twin brother is in the ICU on a ventilator. And, um, you know, keep him in your thoughts. He's probably not going to make it. Uh, they've got him in a ventilator, and so he's in the ICU. And so Neil's dealing with a lot, and he'll be back to do videos shortly. So just uh, keep that in mind. And I just want to say thank you for those who've supported him positively in the chat leaving a comment, hitting the like button, all of that to help Neil's channel grow. You know, this is his little baby and he's watching it grow as he adds water to it and stuff. And every one of you who are fans of his are helping it grow. Thank you, Bill, for uh, Bill Castle for the super chat. All mm. of this goes to Neil uh, or the super sticker. I'm sorry. So thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Just a bunch of people giving love, love a bit of price. You are everywhere, Derek said. Oh, it's delayed. You're everywhere, Derek. Uh, Ethan said, I have the a first edition of Christ Conspiracy. It's an interesting book, but I don't agree with her ideas. And the late 90s internet culture incorporated in its in it is classic. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate that. And so, Dr. Bob, let's talk about some other dying and rising gods. So we talked about Osiris. He's that's a big one. I mean, that's like wow, epic. Is Dionysus a dying and rising god? I've heard, as I've looked into Dionysus, that or Dionysus, however you want to pronounce the name, that there is part of the lore that the Titans ate Dionysus, Dionysus, chewing him, like literally tearing his flesh, and somehow he resurrects from that that death of the Titans chewing the flesh. And this is where Dr. Dennis McDonald in his book, the Dionysian gospel got it over there. I'm not going to waste time getting it. The point is, is that that idea of eat my flesh, drink my blood in Greek. It's that term chew, chew my flesh, like rip it with your teeth. And that's what the Titans did to Dionysus. And it's only in the gospel of John that it's that explicit. So is that a death and resurrection narrative in Dionysus, or is there a better one that is somewhere in like the Bacchae or something else? Uh, that's the one. Uh, he is uh, the he's set upon by the uh, the Titans or the Giants or the Corabantes, depending on what you read, uh, who have been posted as guards by him. Uh, and uh, however, uh, by who Hera- you broke out? Hmm? You broke out by who? Uh, by Hera, Zeus's queen, uh, because um, uh, Dionysus, or as he's called at this stage, Zagreus, uh, he is the bastard son of Zeus, one of several. And Hera is is jealous and is afraid that uh, he's Zeus is going to make Dionysus, whose name, well, he's not called that yet, but Dionysus means young Zeus, oddly enough. Hera's afraid that uh, he's going to choose Dionysus as his successor to the gods and send her packing. 
uh, she she would have been the queen mother if another son had been given the throne. So she doesn't like this, and so she gets the uh, the guardians of uh, Zagreus to uh, kill him, uh, and uh, and uh, eat him. Zeus reduces them uh, to ashes with bolts, and it gets more complicated. Uh, but um, Zeus manages to salvage the heart of Dionysus, all that's left of him. He swallows it, and uh, he becomes pregnant with it. Uh, it's born out of his thigh, which is, like in the Bible, a euphemism for penis, so he kind of re-begets him, you might say. And, uh, and this time, he is named Dionysus. And um, so he, he does die and gets reborn. And this seems to me does count as a resurrection. And he goes on to be um, the savior. He founds a religion uh, where the, the, his followers, the Bacantes or the Minads, are ecstatic, crazed women who leave their domestic chores and their husbands and go out into the wilderness and uh, have chased uh, it's a contradiction in terms, but orgies. I mean, they're not actually having sex. They're just women there, apparently not lesbians, but they're just whooping it up and ripping animals apart, live animals limb from limb, because it's a sacramental repetition of the slaying of Zagreus, Dionysus. And uh, there is, and, and uh, Dionysus himself appears in Thebes, where he has a, a group of these minads and is evangelizing for the new religion. Well, Pentheus is a pilot-like character who happens to be um, Dionysus's cousin. And uh, he doesn't know that, I guess. And he doesn't like this troublemaker uh, undermining marriages. It's very much like the apocryphal acts of the apostles, where the apostles of Jesus are arrested for home wrecking and all that by preaching celibacy. Well. Um, He's, he's going to put a stop to this. He sends his goons to kid, well, to abduct, to arrest Dionysus, who comes along peacefully, but he's jailed, and he sees, and then uh, there's an earthquake. The, <laughs> the jail door swings open, just like in Acts 16, and he comes uh, sashaying out, and uh, uh, Pentheus is pretty shocked. And there's this cat and mouse interview where Pentheus is trying to be the bad guy and say, well, you know, I have authority over you, just like in the Gospel of John. And uh, Dionysus basically says, you're, you're kidding yourself, pal. Uh, and he doesn't yet disclose who he is, but uh, Pentheus can tell something is, is up here. And finally, he uh, says, you want to see uh, my disciples in action? Well, you're going to have to dress up like a woman because they're all women, you know, and you want to pass for one. Why don't I can tell you where they are? Why don't you go there and climb up a tree and watch them from above? Well, he kind of hypnotically converts against his will, like Paul does, and uh, go. He becomes one of the Bacantes, and he goes out there and climbs the tree. But they spot him, and his mother, who is one of them. Uh, rips him to pieces in, in this ecstatic trance, doesn't even know what she's doing, and Dionysus kind of gloats over this, uh, saying, well, we'll show him uh, he, he, whether he can uh, take it as well as he can dish it out, which is just what Jesus says in Acts to Ananias. Uh, I'm, I'm converting this guy. He's going to be my uh, emissary, and uh, I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. And so there's uh, there's a whole lot of uh, New Testament parallels. The Minads have uh, uh, flames above their heads without being uh, burned, and uh, Pentheus is warned by the prophet Tiresias, look, don't persecute this guy. He may really be a god, and then you're going to be caught uh, uh, warring against the gods. And uh, there's why kick against the goads and the whole thing. I mean, it's obvious that it's yeah. a source for. 
for John and Acts. And uh, and he's a dying and rising God. There's no question about that. You know, he wasn't crucified, but I don't think yeah. that's necessarily part of the thing. So, OK, a couple of cool things that you brought up that I'd like to poke and get your thoughts on. First thing in reverse order, here you have Pentheus and he's like in this, uh, I guess you'd say this state of mind where he goes and climbs this tree and the women see him and they go and they tear him up. Is this a reversal of what took place between Zeus and, and Hera? Because here you have uh, her kind of tricking the woman Zeus is in love with and, and ends up getting pregnant with Dionysus. And he uncontrollably zaps her with his power of lightning. And it's like a reverse expectation in the narrative later where the Minads like, uncontrollably, the mother kills her own son. Like I couldn't help it. So here you have like a reversal of expectation, I think. Do you think that's yeah. possible? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You're referring to one of the, the folds in the narrative that I skipped uh, where uh, once Zeus has the heart uh, uh, of Dionysus, he begets him upon Semele, who is a mortal woman that he falls in love with. And she's the bearer of the second Dionysus, not Zagreus anymore, but Dionysus. And uh, Zeus, I'm sorry, uh, Hera tricks Semele, of whom she's equally jealous, uh, to say, why don't you ask old Zeus to show you his power? Uh, and uh, Zeus says, ah, you don't want to see that. Uh, just like in the Bible, man shall not see me and live. But he says, oh, come on, come on. Well, you asked for it. And he just <laughs> a lightning storm, which blasts her to death. So uh, it, uh, but, but uh, Dionysus survives. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. So, sorry, uh, going back a little further, you had me ask a question to Dennis McDonald about the act 17 uh your own poets have said paul saying and he quotes epimenides but really it's not just epimenides me and neil had a long conversation one night and um we talked about this whole passage and thought about your your probing into it and here paul's quoting a passage where we breathe we we move we breathe we have our being and it's talking about zeus and we too are his offspring talking about zeus well, Paul's making this idea about Yahweh. You know, hey, it's, this is the God I'm presenting to you, that we're all the offspring of this God. Um, however, in that polemic that he's quoting, there's these people called Cretans. And this is my, I don't know why, maybe I'm over-parallelizing here, but I want to get your opinion. We talked about Horus being the second Osiris. All right, here, Dionysus is the little Zeus. And I wonder if the Cretans somewhere in the narrative, there's some conflation or confusion where they see Dionysus die and they think this is Zeus or something like that. But he comes back from the dead. Is there something? Yeah. To oh, yeah, there is. Because uh, in Crete, they used to uh, show tourists uh, what they said was the tomb of Zeus, that he had been gored to death by a boar like the one I have on my wall, that you just can't see. Um, see can. And uh, everybody should have a stuffed boar's head in their office. <laughs> um, I know it's a great inspiration to me. Uh, and, uh, and so that's what the Epimenides passage in uh, Titus is about when it says Cretans are always liars uh, about... And, uh, and in the original couplet, it says, for thou art not dead, uh, for in thee we have our, we live our, uh, live and move and have our being. Uh, so, and, and again, Dionysus does mean young Zeus. So I have a hunch it is part of a sequence where uh, Dionysus understood as Zeus is killed uh, but is reborn. I mean, we, we just have a couple of big pieces of that puzzle, but if they suggest anything, it is like the Zagreus Dionysus thing. Mm, thank you so much for that, and thank you all for the comments. Michael Caruso had a question. Is Jesus being baptized his anointing? Well, uh, it is, uh, and the Gnostics and Ebionites took it as his, Jesus being anointed with Christ. 
that uh, what came down upon him or into him, as Mark says, uh, was the Christ spirit or angel, and that therefore Jesus of Nazareth became the channeler, as we would say, uh, of, of the Christ. And uh, the Valentinians had this two-track soteriology. They said that, yeah, Jesus and Christ are not the same. And of course, the epistle of 1 John condemns those who say that Jesus is not the Christ. Well, that was the Gnostics, I think. And they said um, the Christ spirit taught, he was the Gnostic revealer and searched out the, the those who contained a spark of the divine and let them in on their true nature and destiny. And that's all they needed, the self-knowledge that he provided. But what about the uh, common schlumps or the pew potatoes, hmm. uh, the people that were devout and pious in conventional religion? I think they're talking about Judaism and Christianity, maybe paganism too, for all I know, uh, that uh, they mean well, their religion does them good. They believe that they're obliged to keep laws given by the gods. Well, they don't know that there's a higher truth and that the God they worship is not the ultimate deity. It's just the demiurge. He and his archons gave the laws. And, and again, it's not exactly evil. Uh, it's, it's like, uh, would you rather have uh, the mob in charge of your city or no one in charge of it? Uh, well, uh, given those two choices, I guess I'd rather have Tony Soprano. Uh, and uh, and uh, so the, the um, so the 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 uh, ordinary people could be saved by faith in Jesus and His atoning death. It, it's they didn't deny that; they just said there's two different things. And what about the the uh, really the, the slobs, just the people that are, you know, just basically two-legged animals, um, uh, nothing but physical desires, they're damned, uh, just as all of these religions would say. There's no path for them, but there's nothing stopping them either from becoming pew potatoes and right. having faith in Jesus. So, you know, why don't they? Um, they can't become uh, pneumatics, true Gnostics, but that's, you know, they're not damned because of that. Hmm. I love it. I love it. Okay, we got another good question here. Did you cover Ishtar and Inanna? Can you tell us about the connections and is there a dying and rising God situation with this God? Yeah, there's sort gods? of a double resurrection there too because Tammuz is, or, or uh, Adonis, uh, the same two names of the same guy, uh, he was slain uh, and uh, went to the netherworld and Ishtar, who is he's just the same name as Isis, um, she, uh, also Aruru, probably the same thing. Uh, she goes to the netherworld to rescue him. Uh, and she is killed by the guardians of the netherworld and strung up like in a butcher shop. But after a few days, she rises from the dead and then manages to extricate Tammuz and brings him up. But she's only allowed to have him up there, uh, for half of the year. It's another version of the Persephone and uh, Demeter thing, uh, where, uh, and, and they're both fertility myths. Uh, uh, Persephone, Zeus's daughter, is married off to Hades, the lord of the underworld, and uh, she doesn't like it down there. And her mother, Demeter, persuades Zeus to arm twist Hades to let her come back, but wouldn't you know it, Persephone made the mistake of biting into a pomegranate down there, which is the, the fruit of uh, the netherworld somehow. And because of that, she can only get a furlough for every half year. And, and the same thing is true of Tammuz. And, and you, you cannot miss the idea of the cycle of the seasons for this. And, and so th she was a dying and rising God repeatedly. Some of the others weren't. It was just that their death and resurrection was celebrated once a year. But with these, they, they kept celebrating it because it kept happening in, in some invisible world. But what's the difference? 
Wow. I, I really like the agricultural stuff that you keep bringing mm. up because so many people say that's the evidence against dying and rising God's motifs. Uh, Derek Bennett's in the chat. I'd love to have him tune mm. in and join in because he played a part in the Varieties of Jesus Mythicism book. And uh, he has far more insight into this material than I do. Oh, yeah. And uh, great. yeah, yeah, please come join. I just sent you the link in uh, Facebook Messenger, Derek. So, Dr. Bob, something that I, I heard you and Neil talk about the other day, and uh, that was the whole dying and rising God motif attached to agricultural deities. Mm -hmm. And that this is like the seasons are changing, you know, agriculture, a ball cycle, things like this. And then people will say, well, Jesus is not in that vein of dying and rising God. I'd like to get Derek's opinion and then, of course, to get yours. But the New mm -hmm. Testament is loaded. And the scholars will say all of these parables and things that are talking about crop and wheat and tares and, you know, the harvest and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's all like they're talking to real farmers. So the whole point is that these are just analogies to real farmers. This has nothing to do with agricultural uh, deity type stuff. What do you say to that? Mayor Derek. I'm talking to you. I'm bringing Derek on. He'll he'll right. pop up on yeah. the screen with us. I, I admit that that could well be if if you believe in a historical resurrection, uh, you would uh, naturally use some metaphors like that. That's fine. But uh, it seems to me what really shows that that's that's not the way to go is the Last Supper where Jesus says that the wine is his blood, the, the bread is his body. Uh, it's really inconceivable uh, for Jews of any stripe to, to uh, use for holy imagery, drinking human blood and cannibalism. That, that's just, uh, I mean, anything's possible, I guess. But as <laughs> F. Bauer said, the historian wants to know what is probable. And right. uh, that just seems, uh, it has nothing to do with Passover, as they're trying to tell you. That's an attempt to Judaize Jesus. And uh, in fact, it just uh, reeks of, of Jesus being another Dionysus, uh, another Osiris. Uh, there we go. There's uh, so the book. I, they're right. The use of those metaphors by itself does not prove it. But uh, I think the Last Supper thing does. Awesome, Dr. Bob. A couple super chats, and I'm bringing in Derek Bennett. Let ah. me do this. We're going to have the master downstairs because the real underworld is really heaven. And so he is the one, the Ancient of Days, who sits upon the throne. And might as well keep him there where he belongs on the throne. I called him earlier, and I was like, hey, can I talk to God? And he's like, uh, he just left. And uh, I was like, no, 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 you sound like him. So Derek Bennett, welcome to the show. Um, we are filling in for Neil, Neil's twin brother, Um doesn't look like he's going to make it. Uh, he's in the ICU, and I don't know too much more information other than Neil said, D, can you help me out? And I'm like, what kind of question is that? Of course, I can help you out. What do you need? And he said, will you please go and like tell my audience, let everybody know what's going on, and then have a really good show with Dr. Bob. And and uh, I was like, well, he didn't know it was Dr. Bob. I surprised him a little bit with that. But I was like, let's get some other people as well, see if some, some guys can tune in. Um, you have a YouTube channel. And I definitely hope everybody goes and subscribes. Did you want to plug it? Yes. Uh, my YouTube channel, A Theologica. Um, uh, I've monetized the darn thing within a matter of two months. So I'm very pleased uh, with those results. That's great. Um, I, I do want to start by saying that my heart goes out uh, to Neil and to his family, to his brother. Derek, you and I know this yeah. world right yeah bob you wrote the foreword to my uh my brief uh book addictus which is uh um <laughs> this is just this hits home for us is is yeah. my point so my, my heart goes out to him and I'm, I'm i'm thinking about him and um my that has to be said uh big yeah before we discussed anything else so yeah it hit yeah. hard when he told me it was a twin and i was like this is your twin Oh, wow, man. Yeah. I mean, I just, just, I mean, no matter how you chop it up, it sucks. So we hope that everything gets, gets better. I would love to see a miracle happen, honestly. And I say that as somebody who's not convinced of them, but I'd love to see that who wouldn't 
And you know, anyone who doesn't, it just get out of my face. Honestly, it's annoying. Would you like to say yeah. something about that, Dr. Bob? There are inexplicable reversals and uh, uh, remissions and so on. And uh, I would just like to say, given the theme we're talking about, we can hope that uh, he will rise from his deathbed, not yeah. die, but come back. Who knows? Who yeah. knows what's possible? Does I mean, uh, often uh, shocking things happen and people say it's a miracle because they don't know how it happened. Uh, yeah. Well, but but some things happen like that. Let's hope this is one of them. Thank you. Those are wonderful words. Yeah, I've got I've, a couple. I've, super been, I've been very close to death myself, um, um, multiple occasions, in fact, and I'm still here and uh, to to tell my story. So we can yeah. we can still hope. We can still hope. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, Mummy Vale, thank you so much. Question for Dr. Bob. Did Mithra have a virgin birth? I've heard two accounts that he was born from light impregnated a god goddess or something like that. Uh, well, I'm not familiar with that, though. I don't uh, I certainly don't think it's not. So the one the version I've heard was that he was born of a rock. Uh, that he uh, was like, uh, I guess, kind of like Pygmalion, uh, that he had no human parents. Uh, and uh, who knows what it's from, probably or possibly seeing the sun rise over mountains or something since he was a sun god. But uh, the I don't know what the, the other, where the other one is found, but I'm sure he's referring to something I'm just not familiar with. Derek, you know more about, um, or do you know quite a bit about about Mithra? Um, no, my understanding is that um, it, you could call it a miraculous birth, so to speak, but not a virgin birth. He emerges fully grown from a rock. So mm -hmm. we get ourselves into trouble as comparative religion gurus by mm -hmm. speaking of Mithras being born of a virgin. That just gives, uh, you're giving the apologists a lot of rope with which to hang us when we make inflated claims like that. So we want to be careful about that kind of thing. I do um, not to, I guess, a shameless plug for my channel. My Christmas episode should be out by the end of the next week. And I do go into exactly this kind of topic where I do discuss a few examples of miraculous births that come awfully close to the virgin birth of Christ. So stay mm -hmm. tuned for that. Mm -hmm. But Mithras, no. Sorry, go ahead. I'm done. All right, you're done. <laughs> well, guess what? I just plugged his YouTube channel in the comment section. Please go subscribe to Derek Bennett's YouTube channel. Derek, I definitely look forward to you and Neil doing more together as well when he gets back on his feet. Yes. Um, yes. That you guys are awesome. I mean, I really enjoy everything that you guys do, and your presentation that you did on dying and rising gods was just ah. Uh, it's heaven. It's heaven to me, man. So thanks so much mm -hmm. for your insight. I'm glad to have both of you here because something might come up where Bob says, he go, oh, yeah, I remember that. And then something you might say and Bob remembers and it's just uh, bouncing off each other. Thank you. Sean Day has a super chat. Did you want to say something before we get it? You know, I, I could expound on a few of those examples now if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah. Let's not move on yeah, to the topic. I mean, yeah. um, uh, a great resource for this is M. David Litwa's uh, Isis Deuce, the early depiction of Jesus as a Mediterranean god. And he has a chapter in there titled, uh, Not by Semen, Surely. And he does a, discuss a few examples. Like, like a these. semen on the water or like a semen? Semen. Like, you know, <laughs> on the water is naturally what we meant. YouTube? Yeah, I don't, of course. Get, get out of the gutter, YouTube God. <laughs> YouTube. Um, this looks so good by him too, there. though, by the way. <laughs> yeah, Lit was great. I loved your interview with him. Yes, but, um, that's great. The New Testament, I think it's, it's such that the pneuma the spirit of God uh, dwells close to Mary, and that's how she is miraculous, miraculously impregnated uh, with Christ. And we have some, some pretty close examples of this kind of thing. Um, the uh, Danae, I, I, I'm assuming she was a virgin Danae when Zeus came upon her in the form of a shower of gold, 
And that's how she became impregnated with Perseus. So, you know, is it, uh, is it identical to the birth of Christ? No. Is it quite similar? Absolutely. Uh, it's, the, it's Zeus, the spirit of Zeus in the form of a shower of gold impregnating a virgin. Um, a Skylus in the 5th century BC discusses um, the birth of uh, a Paphos. Um, in that story, um, I'm trying to recall how he words it exactly. It's, it is essentially the spirit or pneuma of Zeus that comes upon, you know, this young woman and she is magically impregnated with a Paphist. So there's an, another example there. And then uh, Plutarch, late first century, uh, in his uh, in pneuma, a table talk discussion about uh, Plato having been uh, the offspring of the god Apollo, and uh, Perictione, uh, he says that with a woman, it is not impossible for the spirit of a god to uh, to to bring about, a, you know, impregnation. Um, again, just just by the spirit alone. I think the the previous example I was talking about with Aeschylus, what he says is that it's by the mere uh, uh, inbreathing of Zeus or the mere touch. So it's not a sexual encounter per se, like a lot of other examples. But uh, but here with with um, with Plato being uh, uh, the son of Apollo and Perictione, it is just the spirit of a god who dwells near here, and that's how we get the birth of of Plato. So there absolutely are Greco-Roman examples uh, that come awfully darn close to the virgin birth of Christ in the New Testament. It's a, it's definitely a Greco-Roman type motif. Yeah. that Dr. Bob, did you want to comment on that? I've got a couple of little comments I could say after this, if you want. Well, some apologists will point to the fact that, aha, it wasn't uh, done this way. So miraculous birth, but uh, <laughs> the old, the differences are greater than the similarities dodge. Uh, the, you you see this all over the place, and it's a failure to recognize the, the fundamental notion of an ideal type, that uh, there is, uh, you find several similar phenomena and combine and come up with a kind of an abstraction, a textbook definition that would fit all of them. And then you use that to explain why there are differences. Uh, it's and uh, so nobody ever said uh, that knew anything of what they were talking about that that uh, you have other stories that were just xeroxes of of the nativity of Jesus uh, and it's just even Raymond Brown kind of was guilty of this uh, mm -hmm. uh, some sometimes I think on this one he says well technically there's this and that uh, the the mother was already married though it wasn't her husband that impregnated oh, come on. Uh, it's uh, that's what the Bible calls uh, uh, swallowing a camel, but straining out a gnat. Wow. Well put. Well put. Dragons of Genesis. I'm getting yours first because the next one's a question that's going to continue. Thank you for the super chat helping Neil out. The Mithras rock was totally a virgin, like totally. <laughs> I totally agree with you. Uh, that makes perfect sense. And another interesting, funny comment by our friend Titan Uranus. And uh, he means the planet. And uh, he was born I'm of a rock. I'm not so sure he does. <laughs> he was born of a rock. All rocks are atheists. Therefore, atheists give birth to gods. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Titan, for that uh, comment. I just think it's sometimes funny. This, yeah, sometimes. It just happens. Um, Sean Day, thank you so much for the super chat and helping Neil. Uh, every super chat helps Neil out. This is his channel. And you guys are giving support to him for what he's... Uh, not only going through, but just showing love and helping grow the channel. Hey, Neil, my thoughts are with you. Derek and Dr. Bob and Derek, uh, other Derek, any dying rising mm -hmm. gods outside of A&E, Egypt, Greek, Rome? Would you say there are dying rising gods outside of the Egyptian Greco-Roman cultures, like the dragon festival by China or that they do in Chinese festivals? Isn't that like a rise each year of the dragon or is there anything like that in other literature? 
that well, you know Canaanite, of course, but that's uh, that I'm sure he's he means to toss that in there. Yeah. Um, hmm. I want to say I know I know from studying uh, back around ne nearing 2012 when there was all the the fuss about Mayan lore. Uh, I had looked into that quite a bit. And I think the uh, the father Hunafu of Mayan legend was supposed to have been resurrected. Um, hmm. I mean, that's, you know, no one would argue that that has any kind of bearing on the New Testament. It's a hmm. good thousand years later, but there certainly are other examples. Bob, I'm sure you can think of more as well. Um, uh, well, somebody pointed out that some somewhere in the Mahabharata, it says that uh, Krishna was uh, killed by an archer, I think, and came back to life. Uh, that's not a crucifixion, as some people say, but that might uh, count as one. Um, I, I'm like Joe Biden. I got, I'm got. i under a deadline here, and I am afraid I have to go at this point. Okay, uh, Dr. Bob. You're, you're in great hands with uh, the other Derek. Indeed, Derek. indeed. Thank you for coming on and showing support for Neil. I appreciate you, Dr. Bob. Oh, it was a great pleasure. Thank you. Yes, sir. Bob, uh, good to be here with you for a bit. Yeah. You know you're uh, one of my favorites. Uh, thanks. You too. Have a good night. Good night. All right, Derek. Now that uh, Dr. Bob is off, it's all on you. No pressure. Don't feel any pressure at all. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I mean, it's a common motif. It seems like dying and rising is a, it's nature. I mean, like, so how ridiculous would it be to claim that all cultures have this motif because all cultures experience death and birth and life? And so it just doesn't seem like it would be silly that you would find this on any culture, like on any, anywhere. I mean, I don't care if they're separated from the rest of civilization for thousands of years. They might be way behind in terms of advancements and whatnot. But the idea is we all die, every one of us. And sometimes anomalies might happen or the hope that we won't just cease to exist, that there's the continuation. That's a, that's a human experience that we all have, I think. So maybe that there might, ties there into. might be something akin to that in Viking lore as well. I'm a big Assassin's Creed Valhalla fan. And I've been watching Vikings. I've watched the first four seasons of, four seasons of that on the History Channel. Uh, great show. Can't recommend yeah. it enough. But I think uh, with Olden and possibly Boulder, they might be examples of the myth theme also, though I'm not an expert on this. So don't quote me on that. But it's something right. that might be worth looking into. I could try and bump my uh, talk to my friend John White. He's the the Indo Proto Indo European and uh, Indo European myth guy, so he's all over that. Maybe I can get him to pop on and give two cents. I don't know. Thank you so much, Sean, for that super chat. Michael Atkins, thank you for supporting Neil. And the super chat is Orpheus considered a dying and rising hero. While you do that, I'm going to invite uh, my buddy on see if he's up. Great, yeah. Um, as far as I know, no. Um, I think there is a tale about Orpheus uh, chasing down Theridus, if that's the correct pronunciation, into the underworld and bringing her back. Um, but I, I, I think that's right. But I, but I don't think that Orpheus dies in the process. So my, the short answer, no. Okay. So what a what is Orpheus? Do you know, like, what part, what kind of Orpheus? Uh, if I remember right, was a, a priest of Dionysus, and he was known for having a magical uh, lyre that he played. Um, so, you know, with now the Orphic mysteries, those concern Dionysius Zagreus, whom I heard you guys discussing earlier, and uh, Dionysus undergoes a death and rebirth so to speak and what's interesting there as far as parallels with christianity is the soteriology or salvation scheme involved where the orphics believed that because dionysus zagreus had died and been reborn that they too could be reborn and have a blessed afterlife but uh but again orpheus himself though a priest of dionysus uh, is not depicted dying and rising so far as i know Okay, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for the super chat. I hope it answered your question. And thank you, Joseph. Thank you for the super chat. 
Side topic, was Jesus maybe based on Jesus Ben Ananias or possibly Jesus of Gamala? The Romans then made him a dying and rising God to placate the Jews. My opinion, first of all, this is multiple questions. This is not just one. Uh, based on Jesus Ben Ananias, I don't know that. I don't know that answer. I'm not sure. I have scholars like Steve Mason who say that what we see in Mark with this woe saying Jesus isn't borrowed from Josephus. This is something that Steve Mason thinks, uh, which would mean it's not necessarily based on Jesus Ben Ananias. But if it's Jesus Ben Ananias, Jesus of Gamala, or Judas the Galilean, you name it, like there are people who say there's a lot of common tropes between them, and that therefore they're probably based off each other. To me, it could be that. That's possible. I'm not ruling it out. But it's also very possible that this is what Jews were doing. So this might be common because this is what apocalyptic Jews did or said and acted like. If you were to be a prophet, these are the things you would say or do. So if I follow in the footstep of Derek and uh, Derek is saying this or doing that, and someone a thousand years from now is like highly suspicious of the narrative written about Derek or me or whatever, either way you put it, because we're both named Derek, uh, then you might be like, well, Derek's based off of this other Derek and there is which one's first or who's real. No, I'm, I'm following, I'm self-fulfilling the very things that I'm practicing in the common day of what is going on. So that's my opinion that, that could make sense here. The Romans then made him dying and rising God to placate the Jews. This is a tough question. I wouldn't say the Romans, so to speak, but I would say a combination of Gentiles period. And the Romans kind of sounds more like a top-down Roman provenance position. I'm not convinced of that. I think that Gentiles and Hellenized Jews together could easily have come up with this. They were already practicing stuff like this. Even Josephus mentions, if I'm not mistaken, that Zeus is uh, another name. I could be wrong. It might not be this God, but another name for Yahweh. Like this is something that Josephus mentions that that is a common thing. Now he's writing to a Roman audience, but if you're a Hellenized Jew, you might find ways to connect those bridges and and make your stories line up with the Jews. What are your thoughts, Derek? Uh, just real quick, there certainly are some commonalities between Jesus Ben Ananias and uh, you know our Jesus of Nazareth. But I think that the analogy that you used, Derek, is kind of perfect. Here's two guys both named Derek, you know, even though the spelling is a bit different, both Yours of us is better. involved yeah. in mine's way better. No, way better. Yeah, way. No context. I'm a loser. Well, Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, both of us involved in religious <laughs> studies, uh, both of us with YouTube channels, both of us recovering addicts. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're the same guy. Both of us have blonde women <laughs> as, as our, as our, uh, our, our, uh, better halves. Um, yeah, what we, the list can go on. I wonder what kind of car you have, you know, and we are two different individuals, uh, but I drive maybe a Saturn Okay. Oh, oh. uh, but, okay. but let's, let's, uh, you know, ultimately Jesus Ben Ananias is killed by a rock. Uh, I think having been catapulted, uh, toward him, Jesus, uh, you know, our Jesus is killed by crucifixion. So these are two very different types of uh, execution type methods. Um, it, you know, if, th if this was all just based on Jesus Ben Ananias, why not just depict him having died as he is said to have died in Josephus? So I don't think that these are the same Jesus. I think that these are two different people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, did you want to comment on the second half? The Romans then made him a dying and rising God to placate the Jews? No, I, I don't think that's right. I, I'm, I, I would say that the, the resurrection of Jesus was originally conceived within uh, the matrix of Second Temple Jewish beliefs in, in resurrection, that this all came about as a result of, um, you know, of course, you know, I lean toward historicity. Uh, others may not agree with that. That's fine. It's okay to have different opinions, but I think it was the unexpected uh, death of Jesus by crucifixion that led them to, you know, via cognitive dissonance reduction and other such phenomena, uh, led them to believe that that he had been raised as the first fruits of those who would eventually be raised from the dead, 
We see examples of this kind of psychological phenomena in other religious cults. Um, but, but short answer is, yeah, I think this is something that originally did come about among um, Jewish believers in Jesus, not, you know, before the Romans had anything to do with it. Yeah, I am, uh, I'm more akin to saying the Gospels seem to have been developed once Gentile Christianity is on the, on the page. Um, whether there's a Q or something that's purely Jewish, that's a different question. But, but the idea that Mark, I'm a big fan of Dennis McDonald. I think he's definitely close to the, to the nail, uh, hitting the nail on the head here. And I just personally don't see Jews who are apocalyptic, so to speak, messianic, um, making mimesis to Homeric epics. I could see, Greeks uh, who are now involved in the movement or highly Hellenized Jews. But if the movement did start as a Jewish cult, I have a very hard time believing that this purely Jewish cult and in Matthew, if Mount Matthew's even accurate here, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It sounds very Jewish. Like, like don't go to the Gentiles, screw the Samaritans, only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That seems to be a high red flag to me. Like, would you guys even really be reading Homer and like concern yourself with this stuff? seems like there's Gentile influence on that development, in my opinion, but could be wrong. I just, this is where I start leaning as I continue to research, you know, I, who knows? I might change my mind. And though it began as a sect within Judaism, it absolutely morphed into a Gentile religion. And we see this in the very earliest documents we have in the New Testament, which are Paul's mm. epistles. So even though I think that the, the resurrection of Jesus was originally conceived within a Jewish milieu, there's no doubt in my mind that motifs uh, and sacramentalism that had previously been associated with other dying and rising gods and apotheosized heroes did more or less make their way into the New Testament already yeah. uh, within the hands of, of Paul and some of his predecessors. Especially if his audience is Gentiles. I mean, you're talking to an audience that's probably right. at the local Apollo, uh, you know, temple and the local Dionysian temple. And like here he is talking to these mystery cult practicing followers and whatnot who have these already ideas and they're incorporating them. It's kind of like uh, kind of bad example, but nonetheless, the Roman Catholic Church is kind of taking pagans, converting them to Christianity. Oh, you have that practice? Well, just bring that in. We'll make it Christian. You know, and that's kind of what we kind of see happening right out the gate. Oh, you guys are practicing all that stuff. That's okay. Come on in. We we we'll make it what we have in Christianity and this is the earliest stuff we see. That's that's my thoughts. Um, I mean, look at what we well look at what we do here in the US with ethnic foods. We bring them in here and then we adopt and adapt them to be more Americanized. That that's the kind of thing that we're talking about in earliest Christianity. Mm, Taco Bell, you know, like that's, I used to say that was Mexican food, you know, and it's like, really, really, Derek, would you ever curse Taco Bell and make it something that it's not, it's its own genre. Okay. It is not anything but its own genre. No, I'm just kidding. I would never uh, curse Taco Bell, but it has cursed me. Oh, I bet. I bet. Derek, uh, uh, dragons in Genesis, Jason folks, my favorite miracle birth is that of Noah. He's glowing and flying around the house, scaring his father who thinks he's a Nephilim. Now, have you read this account? I have not read this account. No. That's an no. interesting. I, I suspect it's not in the canon, of course. And that's what I like about Jason. Jason literally explores Jewish lore and gets into like the most crazy stories out there that just don't find their way in our Bibles. But they are they have been written down and kept as part of the traditions and stuff. Uh, yeah, that's what I always enjoy about him. Titan Uranus says the mythical Derek of the future will be an, 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 an amalgamum of the two of you. I think that that might could be the case, man. That might be the case. Probably a lot. Derek, of that I'm looking forward to it. He said, I'm a Derek mythicist, uh, dragons and Genesis. Yeah, that's I probably. am too. I am too. Cause I'm, almost like do we even exist you know like i don't even know philosophically it hurts daddy when you say <laughs> things like that Jason. right oh man my next screen name Derek christ superstar um 
look, we we've got funny, funny comments and stuff and all of that. Derek, while I have you, we were discussing this. I don't know if you saw any of it. I was talking about this updated version. This is the updated DM Murdoch version of the Christ conspiracy, right? Dr. Bob said that her dying wish was that like this work would get finished and he made sure it did get finished. Well, a lot of her work was used by Peter. What's his name of Zeitgeist, uh, the producer, you know, who I'm talking about. Um, he used a lot of her earlier work to create right. the documentary. Neil ended up having, I guess some words on Twitter with him. And these are them. I guess any conversation is a good one. Here's the source companion guide. I hope they read it. Now, I don't know if that was like a direct response or if he's just hoping that Neil sees it, but like, you need to read this, he said. This is pertaining to DM Murdoch's works. This is, I guess, page one. Uh, I want to thank DM Murdoch, a.k.a. Acharya S., for her profound and deeply brave comp uh, commitment to this complex issue. Anyway, I think it goes into like the source material and talking about what was used to make Zeitgeist, at least the Jesus stuff of it. Also, there's correspondence between Neil and Peter Joseph on the topic but dr bob was like if this documentary was based on her earlier works this updated version of her work is far more scholarly and is sourced and it actually isn't making a lot of the claims that the documentary is so maybe uh where peter joseph wants everyone to read his here's the thing you need to read here's the sources honestly i mean this with respect i think peter joseph should probably read this because this updates Acharya S's thinking and Dr. Bob helped edit to make this complete. So I think an updated documentary might be necessary because I actually loved the documentary apart from its issues. I actually loved that documentary. That documentary opened my eyes when I was still a Christian and made me make Jesus step down some notches on the even playing field and say, whoa, what am I doing? Like, what am I believing? How do I know? Those questions started to rise when I watched that Zeitgeist movie. So you want to comment on that? I don't have a great deal to say about that other than that. I think that's a great idea. Make an updated uh, documentary based on, you know, uh, the revised material and include that source material in the documentary for all the rest of us to be able to see and examine. Uh, if there is something to this, you know, hey, I'm an open-minded guy. I'll take a look at it, and uh, and I I I do alter and change my views based on evidence and good arguments. So yeah. you know, give it a shot, and we'll take a look at the work and decide whether or not it has merit. Absolutely, yeah, I I totally recommend that. Derek can speak in tongues, which kind of makes him a god as well. I. We both can speak in tongues, actually, uh, you know, definitely. So, yeah, we've we've got the gift of God. And um, also, Derek Christ, thank you so much. My good friend, Just the Messenger, said, you were never a Christian. You were a pseudo-Christian. What do you what do you say? I mean, I don't know what to tell you, you know. I don't know what to tell you. What do you uh, think, Derek? Uh, we were both placed here on Earth by Satan himself. Yeah, uh, yeah, we disguised We're, ourselves oh, as Christians you're telling for a little them. while. You're telling them the secret. Oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the wrong panel. You you really just gave them a little too much. Just I don't know the if messenger they can hear. Is the name. Yes, bless, yes, yes. Bless your heart, little messenger. <laughs> that's all I got. That's all I got. Do you remember saying that to other people when we were Christians? Do you remember saying that? Did you ever yeah, say those yeah, words? Well, here's the thing. I relinquished Christianity from a very young age. Um, okay. so, so you were a phony. You were a phony. I believed it as a kid, as a child. <laughs> I, I absolutely believed it. Uh, it's like right. Bill Moore said, then I passed third grade. Oh, <laughs> you, you got jokes. I See, got I jokes. was like 20-something <laughs> thinking that a well swallowed a man for three days and three nights. and There was tonky donkeys and talking snakes and all of that kind of crap. I was 20-something when I still thought that that might be true. So I had, I definitely, my growth spurts are extremely delayed, okay? Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Derek can mumble rap. Brad said, "Well, yeah, my shaman handy, my shaman can die." You know, interesting. 
And then uh, Joseph said, Jews in Alexandria were Hellenized. I think Jesus was a, how do you pronounce that? Melange. Melange of several Jesus of the first century. The Jews were in constant revolt. So I do think the Romans adopted a pacifist Jesus. Okay. Can Derek walk on water? Someone said, well, at, duh, duh, you know, <laughs> um, I don't know, Derek, what, what, what are we not touching on when it comes to dying and rising gods? I talked about Osiris with Dr. Bob and a neat little connection to Joseph. So we, we, he sees a connection to the Osiris Smith, Joseph of the Hebrew Bible, Jesus, and then even Josephus. He wrote an article with me on this just to show like there's some type of motif here. Um, we talked about Inanna. We talked about Dionysus. We talked about how Mithras was not crucified. Uh, what else is there that we're missing that's a highly interesting dying and rising God motif? Well, you know, it's it's as I was saying, I think that the the origin of belief in the resurrection of Jesus was Jewish in orientation. And, you know, uh, even even uh, Bob, Dr. Dr. Price has a great article uh, or chapter in the in Jesus is dead where he talks about just that kind of thing, where this is something that arose within a Jewish milieu, but as it spread out into the diaspora, into the wider Greco-Roman and Mediterranean world, it began to, you know, naturally absorb ideas, motifs uh, that had previously been associated with these other dying, rising type gods. So even this is something that Price himself has, has theorized. But um, I, I think that the, first of all, I would say with regard to these dying, rising gods, that they are something on analogy with the resurrection of Jesus. So it's not that the belief in Jesus' resurrection was borrowed necessarily from any of these other stories, but these are phenomenologically similar type tales. They mm -hmm. they are the kinds of stories that we expect to hear from uh, ancient peoples and 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 that time and that part of the world. But um, as for any kind of genealogical associations, what I would say is this, and especially where it concerns uh, Osiris and and Egyptian uh, ideas of salvation that we see in Apuleius's Metamorphoses, <clears throat> Book 11, this idea where uh, Lucius undergoes a sort of ritual or symbolic death and rebirth. Uh, you know, in a manner, he, he is in a manner reborn. He returns once more upon, set upon the course of renewed life. This is something eerily similar to what Paul talks about in Romans 6, uh, being, uh, 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 you know, unified with the death and resurrection of Christ and being reborn uh, mystically via that experience. Now, what people, what apologists will say is that Apuleius's Metamorphoses is from the second century CE, that this postdates Christianity. Therefore, uh, he must be getting the idea from the Christians, right? right. Well, this is nonsense <clears throat> uh, because what we see in Apuleius' Metamorphoses is undoubtedly, um, the, the, it, it, it hails back to ancient Egyptian precursors. It has ancient Egyptian roots. Uh, read Gwen Griffith's uh, The Isis Book, where she examines this and she traces this idea in Apuleius back to the ancient Egyptian mortuary cult. Uh, read SGF Brandon's The Savior God, comparative studies and the concept of salvation. Actually, he's he's one of the contributors to that book, but he has a chapter on the ritual technique of salvation in the ancient Near East, where he discusses how this kind of ritual assimilation with the death and resurrection of Osiris was already part of ancient Egyptian uh, mortuary cult. And by Apuleius's time in the Greco-Roman world, it has morphed a little bit to where that rebirth can be available to the initiate now in the present to the, the living initiate. So mm -hmm. previously you had to die to be identified with Osiris, at which point you would be reborn in the afterlife and, and quite frankly, resurrected with a, a full uh, uh, glorified body, so to speak. 
but now in in the greco-roman mystery religions that salvation and that rebirth is made available here in the present among the living so you can yeah. easily pray you can see how this idea has just morphed uh down the millennia but at my point being where we see this in Apuleius, this is this has ancient this is, has ancient egyptian ingredients all the way he's yeah. not getting it from christianity so that's where we see something that is if not genealogically derived it's definitely on analogy with salvation schemes in these other mystery religions stuff that goes all the way back to ancient egypt in the third millennium bc right that's really powerful i've heard the saying if you die before you die you'll never die like this idea of experiencing death with psychedelics a lot oftentimes there's some form of some ritual drink it doesn't even have to be i'm just saying that is something that is common and um uh, i think our, our good friend just the messenger said the true eucharist ingested by the true i don't know where the true stuff keeps coming up because everybody's claimed to be the true this and the true that but i suspect there this idea the mystery cults uh christians originally would ingest psychedelics and remember how um, I was a phony Christian and whatnot. I mean, like, dude, I've done quite a bit of psychedelics in my life. So I don't know, man. You might want to rethink me being a true messenger uh, of, of, of what you're, uh, you're spouting here. Also, the Christ equals Moses equals Elijah equals Osiris equals Muhammad equals Mani equals I can't even pronounce it equals the living word of God. I was like, you forgot to add equals Derek equals, you know, Neil. Uh, there's so many names in here we forgot, but... Uh, you know, anyway, I just figured I'd mention that. So when you don't really know, you might want to hold off. You know, if you don't have gnosis on all of this, you might want to reserve your opinions on things. Uh, either way, though, the, the point is, I love what you said. And now they're experiencing death before dying, finding a way to live forever. And Jesus has these clear declarations in the gospel saying, anyone who believes in me will never die. And, and what is that belief? Belief's not just the mental ascension of what we think of as faith oftentimes he he says in the gospel of john you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood you will not live so that belief in in practice seems to be what they're saying you can live forever just by starting now and and that plays into what you're saying here in the greco-roman world with that practice interesting yeah anyway yeah. i'm just having fun <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh I really hope everybody goes and subscribes to your channel. Um, I don't want to miss anything in particular because there's so much you talk about in your chapter. Let me ask you this real quick. And then I'm going to let you say whatever you want to say before we go. Cause uh, I really hope people do subscribe to you, Derek. You have quite a bit of insight on this stuff. I've never read in your chapter on varieties of mythicism in, in the book. What particularly do you discuss? Is it like your lecture but in writing or far more detailed? Uh, it, it, it is like my lecture in writing, but more detailed in that uh, there's something like, there's like 40 something footnotes in there, plus all of the in-text citations. So there's a lot of material in there that you can follow up on and read for yourself. Right, so uh, right. That, that's, it's a it's a great resource if you want to go and learn more and read more scholarship about the topic. Um, Carrier has praised it uh, to the skies, which I very much appreciate. I'm grateful for that. And um, uh, the, and and one of the major points I'm making is 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 I'm rebutting this apologetic uh, assertion that all of this stuff died out in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century, that's just false. <laughs> it's just not true. Um, the, the most recent monograph that we have on this topic comes from John Granger Cook in 2018. And he's got an article from uh, 2020 in uh, Ancient Near Eastern magazine about resurrection in the Mediterranean world. Scholars are still talking about this stuff. Not everyone agrees, but there absolutely are still scholars who uphold the, these parallels and the whole notion that, yeah, there were gods who were said to have died and been resurrected or reborn or immortalized in some form. It's, it's not just outdated scholarship. And this is a, I hate to say it, it's a, it's a flagrant lie. <laughs> mm. You know, I don't know what else to call it. I mean, it's just not true what the apologists say about this. 
Um, and, and I think another thing that's interesting to note when it comes to resurrection apologetics, because that's what that's something I want to dig into in the future as well, is the arguments that are made on behalf of the resurrection of Jesus. But uh, when it comes to, you know, what, what would constitute good evidence for the resurrection of Jesus? I know this is going to sound almost... Um, parochial maybe, like elementary, like almost childish, like something a third grader would say. But it, that's 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 because sometimes kids have a way of cutting through the BS, the, the sort of psychological baggage that we as adults have, have accrued over the years. I think mm-hmm. a child would ask, well, if he was resurrected and if he is immortal and he lives eternally, where is he? You know, if if Jesus was resurrected and he lives eternally, what better evidence could there be than the resurrected Christ himself? Well, no, 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 you don't understand, Derek. He he was taken up into heaven. He's no longer here. He's in heaven now. Well, of course, how convenient. Of course, that's what the New Testament itself says, right? right. But the point is that in just about every single instance of this mythane, whether you're talking about Osiris, who is uh, bodily reconstituted, reanimated, and made alive again, thereby resurrected, but that he goes on to Amenti, right, or uh, or the Duat, he has to go on to another, he's relocated to a supernatural realm, uh, Romulus is immortalized, he's assumed into the heavens, Asclepius is raised by Zeus, he's taken up into the heavens, Hercules uh, is 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 raised from the the flames on Pyre. the funeral pier, you know the yeah. pyres. Excuse me, thank you. And uh, and now lives upon Mount Olympus. They all have to be relocated to a supernatural realm. Why? Because that is how you make the belief unfalsifiable. That's how you do it. Whether it's Jesus, Romulus, Osiris. That's how you. In, 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 let, can I put that in a in a nicer way? Let me package that in a nicer way. <laughs> yeah, I don't, go ahead. I, yeah, let me let me try and say this because we anachronistically, this is a great point you're bringing up that it's not unfal- it's unfalsifiable. But what I think Derek is trying to get at, and all that they were trying to do is trying to say, don't doubt it, just believe it, because they've put it somewhere so you can't prove yourself false. You can't prove that right. it is false so that you will believe that that's what's going to aspire for yourself or that you will have faith in that deity. One might call that deception. One might call it whatever you want to call it. But at the end of the day, if we were able to prove that that wasn't true, the faith would be redundant. People wouldn't want to believe in things that they have no evidence for, which is the definition biblically of faith, things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. And Oftentimes, that's exactly what Hebrews 11, I believe it is, goes through the whole chapter trying to describe of things that oftentimes aren't evident. They, they, they're like, this doesn't look like that's what's going to happen. And they're still holding on and supposedly acquiring that. So, yeah, I think that it is what you're saying as a skeptic. I'd look at it and go, yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Put it somewhere where they can't find him. Of course. Right. Put the body in a place where no one will be able to find it. So, therefore... You can't say it didn't happen. So, you know, that all the naysayers. Yeah. And my apologies if, uh, if, uh, you know, if I, if I, if you misunderstood, I'm not saying that the earliest followers of Jesus were being deceptive and purposefully uh, construing it that way. I'm sure that they sincerely believed this. It's just that's how you go about rationalizing something in your mind that had hey yes this did happen it just it took place in in an imperceptible realm where you know we can't see him touch him anything like that Um, that's how you construe a belief in your mind so that you can hold on to the belief by making it unfalsifiable Mm. yep 100 percent absolutely uh Derek, final words, anything you'd like to say, uh, and then I'd love to talk about Neil for a second. Um, uh, th- there is uh, my, my most recent video uh, is on this topic, on uh, rising gods before Christ. Uh, you can find that's the most recent video on Atheologica, if you want to go check that out, where I'm rebutting some of the uh, assertions of 
apologist William Lane Craig. So check that out. Check out my chapter, Dying and Rising Gods in Varieties of Jesus Mythicism. Uh, I've gotten some great uh, compliments on this stuff, which I hugely appreciate and very much grateful for. And, uh, and with that, uh, yeah, take it away, Derek. Um, so I met Neil uh, three, four months ago, I'd say. And um, he he's been like really into all of this stuff that we're talking about today and more. He's sincere. You know what I mean? Like he really is in love with the stories and the history and the literature. And he's become quite skeptical since me and him have bumped into each other. And like considering these things, he's become more critical of what he believes and things like that, which takes a lot of effort when you hold on to things you think are sacred or you have experiences. So it's very difficult to do that. But, you know, me and him have been tight. I mean, like we talk every day, multiple times a day. And then just day before yesterday, I think it was yesterday or day before yesterday, he wrote me and he said, Hey D, um, can I talk to you for a second? I'm like, yeah, 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 what's up? And I could tell something wasn't right. And then he said, my brother, uh, he's in ICU. He's on a ventilator and, uh, he's brain dead, I think. And they're not, he's not going to make it. And I knew right away when he said that, like in my head, I already had some ideas without going, well, what happened? Tell me what happened and blah, blah, blah. You know, like I already had my thoughts of what may, may have happened because me and Neil, we were pretty open and close, but all I could do was like, just kind of hurt, you know, that hurts because I had dreams for years and I'm not exaggerating that I was burying my brother, my brother. And this was his twin. So for everybody who's watching this show, everybody who appreciates Gnostic Informant and Neil, reach out to him, email him, show him some support. Obviously, don't overburden him, but like, if if you like what he's doing, you want to help support him, you can always become a patron of his. Uh, you can always, you know, like the videos, even if you can't afford to help out in any way. Like the video, comment, show him some support in the chats, and. You know, just keep him in mind. And if you're a person of faith, do whatever you particularly desire to do. I mean, I'm not knocking anybody at any point for anything. I just want you to know that Neil's going through a tough time. He even asked me, please, Derek, will you uh, will you jump on and, and do a video so that we can keep, you know, the, the audience, uh, let them know what's going on, keep them informed, but also keep YouTube paying attention to my YouTube channel because I'll probably be putting more energy into this now that I come back to kind of distract my thinking. And I said, yeah, 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 man, of course, anything. And so I shocked him with Dr. Bob. I felt really good about that. I was like, Hey, I got, I got some people I'm going to reach out to. I called you and uh, a few other people that weren't able to make it, but uh, we came and did the show and uh, who knows, man, maybe he rises from, from this deathbed, like Dr. Bob says. And, but uh, being a realist, if that doesn't happen, understanding that we we got to heal and try to move forward so keep nil in your thoughts and uh for those of you who are people of faith whatever in your prayers um at the end of the day i just wanted to show up show my friendship show my dedication for my friend nil and his channel and i hope you do too and derek thank you for you know jumping on here and show, showing support by just giving your insight and uh letting us know where we can also go follow you and support you and you have a patron as well so like it's a big family. We're a community. Yes. And, and, and I want everyone to know that like we connect. We want to have a platform where other people can jump around. You may go and watch my channel. Go, I like some of Derek's stuff, but not a big fan of all of it. I like some of Bennett's stuff. You know, I'm differentiating you from me because you're so much better. I can't even say your first name. I don't even want to begin to. Uh, <laughs> no, but seriously, like it's, it's a huge community and we all, the body of skeptics, you know what I mean? He might be the arm and I might be the feet, but to those apologists out there, why do you persecute me? That's that's the question I have for you. <laughs> uh, seriously, thank you for joining, Derek. Let's do this again, man. I'm glad I could be a part of this. Um, and, and I love what you said. It, 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 we are a community. That's what I love about this is how supportive we are all of each other. We're not competing. No, you know, we are. I can't compete with you. <laughs> We're upholding one another and supporting one another and loving one yeah. another. Uh, you know, that's I've always said that's one of the things that religion gets right. And yeah. we need that, too. We need that sense of community and camaraderie and, and that that network of support. Uh, so, I, you know, that that said, I 
I, I, I'm very grateful to be a part of this. I'm glad you reached out to me. Neil, we love you and we're here yeah, for we you, me. brother. We'll be we will you, be here to see you through this. Yeah. And uh, anyone watching, feel free to reach out to Neil. Show him love, support, especially leave a comment. Especially when we're done with this live, leave a comment. If you just find it in your heart to want to help out, go to every video he has. Hit play and walk away if you don't want to watch the content. Let the YouTube algorithm pick it up. Drop a comment just for the algorithm. That helps the channels grow, believe it or not. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Neil, for everything you do, bro. Don't give up. Don't give up hope. Uh, don't give up at all. What you do is important to all of us and educating the world. And it's a passion of yours and we all see it. So we love you, man. And thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Derek. Everybody, you watch the Gnostic Informant and you have achieved true gnosis.